Have you ever wondered what it's like to do what you love in over 30 countries? To live into the unknown that comes with playing professional sports overseas? It's something that I've always been curious about. And today, we sit down with Ryan J. Owings, a former Team USA professional volleyball player and founder of Elite Volley, to find out how he got here and, more importantly, what he's up to now. Ryan founded his sports agency while he was playing to empower athletes worldwide to really reach their potential beyond that playing field. This is episode 162 with Ryan J. Owings, and you're tuned in to Forever Athlete Radio, where together, we go far. I'm your host, Corey Camp, forever athlete, founder, and your personal performance coach, helping you find flow. Now let's get our flow on with Ryan. Welcome to the show, man. I appreciate the time. You were just telling me off camera, like the crazy travel schedule that you have ahead. So I appreciate just grabbing you for a few minutes here. First and foremost, how are you doing? I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to be on. I really appreciate you uh, for asking me and I really like what you're doing. I mean, it took us some time to, first of all, for me to even get into it. I heard some (laughs) of your podcast episodes and I was like, I really like what this guy's doing. And yeah, it just, it, it's nice to know that somebody noticed what I was doing out there too, because I think we're very aligned in that way that we want to help others to really just help themselves, I guess. Yeah, man. Well, first off, I appreciate that. I, I love connecting with other fellow podcasters because we can just dive into it. Why don't you give the audience a little bit of a glimpse back into kind of how you got to this point in time? Volleyball was this mm-hmm. vehicle for you. How did you get find yourself in the driver's seat of that vehicle in the first place? Yeah. Oh, man. I was a passenger for so long, actually. <laughs> And this is what my true goal is to help athletes be the driver. Mm. And it took so many years. But how it started is a math class with Patrick Palma asking me, do I want to try out for the volleyball team? And me just thinking Top Gun and then figuring out, nope, it's indoor. <laughs> it's these boys playing. I'm in my skateboard shoes, trying out, doing approach jumps around this gym, not knowing what's happening, but loving like meeting new people and how hard it was to do each of the things that I had no idea it takes like so much to do one, like just for one point in volleyball and one skill, there's so much happening and so many people. And I I liked how complicated it was. Mm. So um, yeah, I tried, I I learned really fast. I think the snowboarding and skateboarding, all the extreme sports helped me with awareness of body and just, you know, whatever. Um, Also I I knew how to fail because I've fallen so much in those different (laughs) sports. So like, Failing for me was just normal. I didn't even really think about it. Uh, Making mistakes is a whole nother thing. So um, when I started volleyball and I, I graduated high school, I didn't get recruited. And and then I ended up writing a friend while I was in Durango, just snowboarding, thinking maybe I would go that route. And he said, like, I'll try to convince my coach. He did. Uh, That was Chris Barnes. And he played after that season when I came with him and he convinced his coach without video, take this guy and bring him on a spot, a scholarship. It was crazy for NAI though, uh, but still, and um, we played and I said, man, I I really know I could go far with this. I see it. I feel it. And you're way better than me. And so he decided to go to George Mason, became an all American. I went out to Cali, played for some Juco's promoted myself a lot with videos and and emails trying to get people to come to the games they did I was going halftime that first year at JUCO and then the second year I played and I got some really nice offers I was talking with USC Pepperdine Hawaii uh, I think Long Beach and somebody else and then Mm. it fell through last minute because of yeah it's sad when you find out that schools can make mistakes too not just like normal everyday people and that sucks because I worked really hard until that moment um but you know you're always working towards being the best you can in any moment and towards the future so you got to let what happens happens i ended up going to another nai school to finish my college let's say career Mm -hmm. um and then from california i met a a greek or greek a german guy and he said like we have pro overseas and like everywhere in europe and i was like what I was like, wait, so a pro do this like Olympians and stuff. They play there. And he's like, yeah, a lot of national team players. It's the only place to play, but you guys don't have that. And so I'm going to Mm -hmm. Europe. I used my whatever student aid money to get over to Europe. Spent my first summer in 2002 over there. And I didn't leave until 2005. Uh, I lied saying I was another position, tried out for team. I found all these teams. It was just crazy. It was fun going on Greek sites, Russian, whatever. No Google Translate back then, 2002. 
And uh, 2005, I took a, a, a big risk and, and moved for myself. And I'd, I'd been promoting myself, trying to find new stuff all the time. I wasn't scared of that. It made me nervous, but I knew what do I have to lose? They just maybe don't answer or they say no. Mm. And that was scary, but Team USA called me back. Hugh McCutcheon had taken over the team. I saw that as an opportunity that maybe he'd be open-minded. It landed. He was. He invited me. I made the 18-man roster. Uh, he saw a vision as me being a receiver like I hoped to be. I learned how to receive with him. A year later, I started an agency. I knew I needed to help players because all the other players were saying, dude, they just agents – they don't care about you and the teams, mm -hmm. they don't either. You're all just a product. It's just money and people are going to use you. And even teammates are doing it, you know? And I said, somebody has got to do better. Like we're, we are humans, you know, like, and I didn't get that far in life by people just screwing me over. A lot mm -hmm. of that happened, but so many more were just supportive and selfless and amazing. And therefore I, I just went that path, you know, and I kept the agency. I, I learned business in school and I kept learning it ongoing. And then I realized we're really the problem. Other mm. people aren't the problem. And I was like, if we want to be better and get more out of life, we have to become more than just an athlete, more than just our sport. And that's why I started Beyond Athletic. That's why I love the education part. That's why I mentor our athletes. And that's why I'm here today. What led me to you is all of that, honestly. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, first off, fantastic job condensing your life story into <laughs> like three minutes, four minutes worth of things. There's so many different options that we could double click and dive yeah. deeper on there. But one of the first things that really stood out to me in our first conversation before we even sat down to record this was really how much you believe in the same principle and value that I have that human interaction can't be transactional. It shouldn't be transactional. Yes. The moment that it does become transactional, we have lost. And it seems to me that's what was kind of glaring at me, the why behind you first getting into, okay, well, I want to become an agent and help other players feel like they actually have value beyond just their athletic skills, which is obviously, hello, synergy between the yes. two of us here. <laughs> hello. And then the other thing that really uh, stands out to me there that you mentioned briefly towards the end was this shift of, well, in order for us to expect better, we have to change, take ownership over our own situation and change 100%. maybe what it is that we are tolerating in the first place. So talk to me how is that education piece going? Because it is very hard to, well, at least I can only speak to my experience. My experience, it's hard to convince people to take ownership of situations that they might feel are unjust from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So how's that been <laughs> for you? What challenges have you been facing? Talk to me. Yeah, uh, honestly, it's so true. And I just got off a call with a recruit of ours for the agency and I was talking about that. And it was just like, you know, we're our own, our own worst enemy and we deny it or ignore it or not, mm. can't even be close to being aware of it because we just haven't tuned or built those skills um, for mindfulness and awareness because we are so detached from ourselves that yes, man, it can take forever. And so it's basically, I mean, there's rules of life, right? Mm. It's either it's going to be nature or nurture that's going to teach you, right? You're either going to get to the moment naturally by just doing and making mistakes and having no input other than just effort and a response for that, right? A result of whatever happened or did not happen. Or you're going to have nurture, which is going to help you understand, okay, you need to make mistakes. You need to try and you need to make mistakes, but here are things that you do not need to try, mistakes you do not need to make. Mm -hmm. And um, in order to even be open to that, yeah, we have to be aware of ourselves, our ego, how we, how we get in our own way, the, the script, the story that we tell ourselves, the things, the beliefs that we have, the, the idea that we, we shape and shift our beliefs at mm -hmm. will. And, and that 
sometimes for some people, unfortunately, and for me, I was one of them, it took a lot of nature, <laughs> a mm. lot, man. And yeah, so for our athletes, I'm, I'm really, I try to be extremely patient and I try to be as detailed as I can and also uh, efficient sometimes uh, with the players who I understand they I can't go deeper. I can't mm. detail things out because they're already so overwhelmed. They put so much pressure on themselves. I can only try to point out the things that help them get closer to the solution and like reinforce it. Yes, that's right. Keep going that route. I know it's hard. Keep going. And then hopefully, I mean, it sounds maybe sad to say, but it's not. I feel like if you're healthy, hopefully there's a breakdown, right? Hopefully there's a wall. Mm. And then you're like, oh, what do I do? You look for the advice. You look for the mentorship, both internally and externally. And now you're on the right path because now you're shifting. Now you're changing. Yeah. I feel like especially a change of that magnitude, we need a catalyst for it. Yes. And it, oftentimes it does have to manifest itself in something that might be a hardship or might be some sort of breakdown, but oftentimes that can lead to a more powerful breakthrough to your point. Exactly. exactly. What you alluded to you being one of them, quote unquote, uh, uh -huh. what do you mean by that? And could you elaborate on what helped you then shift to who we're seeing and, and listening to right now? Yeah. Um, okay. So if I think about the younger me, when I was uh, trying to like jump on rails, when I had like inline skates mm -hmm. on, right. Like doing aggressive rollerblade, I, <laughs> I got to the point it'd be, it'd be overcoming the nerves and scared and you don't have the technique and you're trying to do these things. And I can remember my, remember back to then, and I would, I found um, if I couldn't find the courage internally with just like telling myself or trying, I, I tried to distract myself, right? And I, I remember my go-to song became uh, A B C one two three Jackson Five. I don't know the actual name of it. Maybe it's one two three. Whatever. <laughs> And I would just put it in my headphones or I would sing it, dude. And I would just get myself into a lighter mood. And I realized mm. that what I was doing is I was just weighing myself down with the fear and the, the concern and the worry. And that um, really, I never really built the skills to deal with that, to learn how to lean into it. Because mm. that was the actual problem is that I wasn't leaning into it. I was running from it or ignoring it or freezing in the moment. And so how I built it were some, some situations that stand out in my life to say that I changed it was one standing up for myself versus my father built a lot of confidence in me because I was just tired of taking shit. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But, um, also I knew I was worth more than I felt I was worth to the person doing things to me for whatever reason they had or didn't have whatever. It didn't matter. I realized I was truly worth it. I didn't just like think, man, I'm worth more. I was like, no, I'm worth more. And I stood for it. That was one key moment. Another key moment that stands out is being screamed at by a manager in Germany that I was uh, privileged and I wasn't entitled and I was like not a hard worker and I didn't care and blah, blah, blah. And it was so far from the truth. And it was me seeing well, I didn't know at that moment, but somebody who truly had ulterior motives and really just wanted to tear somebody down and make an example of them. And I gave into it. Right. And then I lost that job and I lost that opportunity that I was going to capitalize on. Man, I had a great preseason, mm. even with the messed up fingers. And I realized in that moment after I unpacked that, because I was thinking like, why? Why did this go so bad? Why did it spiral? Why did it happen in the first place? And why did I react the way I did? And when I finally figured that out, that like, crap, it's because like, I can't control him. I can't, and he can't control me and he can't understand truly what I'm doing. So that means that I've just got to stay true to me and I can't be swayed by other people. Now, learning the skills to do that took forever. The mm. next huge step, I think there's two more. One was national team and there's a middle blocker with Team USA. Legend. And I'm playing with him and many other legends that I'm like, whoa, I watched them for the first time my first year in volleyball at Atlanta Olympics. And this guy, Tom Hoff, that I had so much respect and admiration for. It. And I watched because I would I always stretch longer. Maybe that's one of my secrets for staying healthy. Mm -hmm. But um, 
he would stay after training sometimes, not every day, but like sometimes, and especially like it'd be a really hard training, difficult, like competitive. Everybody's going, not just sweats, like mentally and emotionally competitive and talk like tolling. Um, and I remember there was this one particular day that stands out in mind and I want you to think about how the lens I was looking at him and I was watching mm -hmm. him make this blocking move to work on this very minute detail but I couldn't know what he was working on. I just knew what he was doing so I could guess. So I asked him when he finished, cause he came over, he was stretching, take off his shoes, whatever. And then he said, I said, what are you doing? He's like, well, we saw in video and we, we were doing the timing. I'm 0, 0.0 something seconds slower reacting this way. And I want to just like get cleaner with that, more efficient with my moves so I can make up that time <clears throat> because that could equal at least closing the block, taking away options or getting a touch or best case, maybe a block. And I was like, that's awesome. That's so cool. Because when I'm working, I'm just like, I just want more reps. I think more reps are going to help me. And that's mm -hmm. it. And I love that work, but not so detailed. And like, dude, he's one of the best blockers in the world. So fast forward. At some point, I have a day where I'm spiraling. Man, I can't, I can't make another error. Oh, another error. Okay, I'm really good. Error. Crap, I suck. Oh my God, everybody's looking at me. What do I do? I feel terrible, blah, blah, blah. I really want this bad. I want this more than anything. And then I'm just, I'm closing in on myself and imploding and I'm trying to on the exterior look like I'm fine. But really mm -hmm. I look like I could give two whatever, right? And he looks at me, stops, the, the drill stops and I'm frustrated and all I want is to be better and I want to be good for this team and I want the Olympics. I want the dream. And he looks at me and he goes, can I curse? Can I? Yeah, go for it. He <laughs> goes, my favorite question on the show. He goes, uh, if you don't want to fucking be here, then go the fuck home. We don't have time for you to be selfish, to not work hard like us. You're no different. What you go through, what you're going through, what we're going through, it's all the same. And we can't get anywhere if you stop that progress. So if you want to act like this, then don't, don't stay. Go home, wherever mm -hmm. you came from. And I was like, <laughs> like, like in that moment, I was like, holy crap, man. Like, this is serious. I am a problem, not just to myself. I was thinking I was a problem to myself until then. Mm -hmm. I realized I was a problem to others. So those nature environments, they really helped me see that every time the common theme was I was making decisions that would affect not just me, but others. Everything had two sides. And then it came in, in the sport. The moment I decided to become an agent is when I lost a player that I believed in so much and I worked so hard for. I was in the top teams in the world, some of them, in Italy and Turkey proposing this player for her whole career. And then until that point, and she wasn't ready for it. And at that moment, it was a nice time to maybe shift. And I was trying again, trying to prepare for when she was ready. Mm -hmm. And when she gave up on me and said that, I don't think that you can get me these deals because I don't have it right now, but she was on the best team and she had been on the best teams and she wasn't ready for it yet. And those teams knew about her. I realized it I can't control other people all I can do is just buy into what I'm doing and invest in getting myself as balanced and as strong as I can so that I have that to give to those that are ready to receive it. And man, that's when I got to work. I, I got to work quick and I didn't even believe it or not, Corey, I owned an agency since 2006. It took me until two years ago to decide that I actually was an agent because I hated the idea of agents mm. because they had screwed me so much. And I said, I can redefine it. And that's where we're at. Long winded but I hope that was really helpful. I mean, I hope people listening in go back and play that over four or five times because there are so many different nuggets of wisdom in there that we could, again, dive deeper into. One of the things that first stuck, stuck out to me is like the, the notion of the 0.01 or 0.0 whatever coming from mm -hmm. the swimming world. Like that was what I freaking lived for. I would train nine months out of the year to drop 0.01 in a mile, which is like a 16, 15 minute race. So I, I understand like the minute details and what goes into mm -hmm. that. Um, and I love the tidbits of wisdom around it has to be like the, where the locus of control is, 
Is mm-hmm. it on you internally or is it an external locus of control? Is the world yeah. around you dictating how you live your life or are you dictating how you live your life? And yeah. our outside yeah. world is often this reflection of our inner world. Yeah. Um, I know we are a little pressed on time. I want to ask no. you a We've couple got for sure. Five, five. Perfect. Minutes, we got a few, seven. we got five. We're going to go rapid fire uh, here in a second. Um, I love asking the fast five, but before we get into that, talk to me about owning the word agent, owning that identity. Okay. Piece. And how That's else do you question. identify to these days? Okay. Oh, it got better. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, agent to me means um, someone who can influence someone mm. and support someone and can choose to do it with pure intentions or not. And for me, It's important to live by the code that I've set for myself and the code that I expect and hold others accountable to. Whether or not they like it, that is what it is. I can be okay with if they don't meet that, but those are the boundaries that I need to have in my life and my work. So for my work, it's like, this is how I work. Mm -hmm. I'm there for you. I will give you everything. All I expect in return is that you try to be aware of if you're not or are giving everything and we just keep going that route and it's reciprocal and I will always be on your side and fight for you and you always be on my side and fight for me. So honestly, this is where I'm at with the agency thing and this identity of I'm just here. I will drop Mm. pretty much everything, especially if it's an emergency, I'm going to be there. But really it's about like, connecting as a human to this other person Mm. how can i help you be the best version of you enjoy this journey that you have decided to go on a drive with you know this sport Mm -hmm. journey how can i teach you how to drive that car and stay in it and then after you decide to park the car or get a new car or do whatever you're you're good to go all right that metaphor is used up now me how do i identify i identify as basically uh a let's say socially socially focused entrepreneur Mm. and loving friend uncle and future father let's say beautiful i'm putting a lot of time into my family and just trying to be close to them whenever i can in america and everything i do uh in terms of like creating something of value Mm -hmm. it has to have a social component to it and i don't need to make money for that to be socially valuable to me Um, but i do need to have return on investment so i do need to see that i've been able to help people that you know i also can support myself and i also can have security these kinds of things so yeah but you you asked a question that i'm gonna think even more on bro and, and the, define we're really well those are my favorite kind of questions man and i yeah, just want to say that it's, it's such a beautiful answer and says a lot about you that's why i love that question um of asking really how do you define yourself beyond what you're doing for a living because that actually gives people a better snapshot of who mm-hmm. ryan is rather yeah. than Totally. Oh, he's an agent <laughs> or yeah. he, he runs this platform, whatever it may be. want to go quick, rapid fire, one sentence, okay. one word answers for you to provide an even better snapshot. First question, so we got five in total, is what's your go-to podcast that you're jamming out to? School of Greatness. Great answer. That's what we connected on originally, I feel like, too. <laughs> yeah. Number two, what's your go-to book that you've read in the past year? Peak Mind, Dr. Amishi Ja, boom. Oh my gosh, she nailed it. It's incredible, incredible. Okay. Every other mindfulness, blah, 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 book at this moment, don't start, start there. Start, start there. with that one. Ground zero, that's a, that's a huge place to start. Number three is what's something you can't live without? Love, mm. self-love first. Ooh. They just, the answers keep getting better. Number four, what's a quote that you live by? 
Ooh, uh, hold on, hold on. I mess it up because I'm terrible at remembering these. I got to minimize everything and then I'm going to tell you, okay? Uh, one sec. You still hear me, right? Yep, we're here. I didn't close anything out. I know I'm like <laughs> getting to it. Go away stuff. Uh, I have it on my the back of my uh, computer. Here it is. I have nothing in common with lazy people who blame others for their lack of success. Great things come from hard work and perseverance. No excuses. Mm, that's powerful. That's powerful. Kobe Bryant, baby. He's, he's a good guy to, to live your life after. <laughs> Pretty good role model. Uh, last one. If you had to sum up your point of focus right now into just one word, one intention, what does that, that look like for you right now? Be present. Mm. Sorry, two words, but one idea. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, Ryan, man, that was fun. Super ra rapid fire. I know a little short yeah. overall, but I, again, I appreciate the time before we plug where people can find you. I just want to take a second to acknowledge you and just the way that you show up, you carry this really light energy about you and you're very open with your journey. So I appreciate that. Where can people find more of your journey, find more of what you're up to with Elite Volume? elite volley beyond athletic and all the other great things that are you beyond what you do for a living. For sure. Uh, first of all, thank you. I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful for those words. And also it's a pleasure. I can't be, uh, the best me without someone else giving mm -hmm. that energy to, um, the places where people can find me, Ryan J Owens on everything. J-A-Y spelled out. I mean, you type that into anything, you're going to find me. You're going to find what I'm up to. Uh, Beyond Athletic podcast is really what I want to do with my life, like uh, that social venture. And mm. uh, yeah, I can't wait to start building it up. But um, yeah, those two places are the best places. Instagram, I'm probably on the most. Amazing. Amazing. We'll plug it all below in the show notes. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, you're tuned into Forever Athlete Radio, where together we go far. Ryan, thank you again for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Corey. 